Hello and welcome. The Lord gives wisdom. From him comes understanding. The Lord stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He guards the path of justice and preserves the faithful. Let your wisdom enter our hearts and minds, O Lord. Let us pray. O God, keeper of wisdom and understanding, you have brought us together into your presence this day. Grant us grace to worship you as we seek your blessing and your knowledge. Help us to grow in heart and mind with you, Lord. Build us up in your spirit so that we may know your love and be strengthened by your righteousness. Help us to be bold in our faith so that we may do your will joyfully and eagerly. May we worship you in a spirit of truth that we may follow you all the days of our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Today's reflection is Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends nor heap shame upon their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised but who honor those who fear the Lord who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. We read the words of Psalm 15 and hear what God seeks in his people, that the Lord calls us to speak the truth, that we should seek to be impartial in giving justice to all people, that we are called to treat people fairly, Do you do your best to honor God in all that you do? How do you share God's love as a way to honor God? How do you help others to share in God's love in their lives? How can we celebrate God's love as a community? How are we all inspired by the Holy Spirit to live in the love of our risen Savior? Let us pray. O God, you are our hope and our praise. Help us to seek your wisdom in all that we are and do. May we be strengthened by your steadfast love and faithfulness as we come before you in prayer this day. Help us, Lord, that you lift us up in both our joys and our sorrows. Be with us in both our laughter and our tears. May your light guide us and lead us to life everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let the words of our mouths and meditations and of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our readings today are from the New Revised Standard Version Bible, and our first scripture reading comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Our next reading for today comes from Romans, chapter 16, verses 1 through 16 and 21 through 23. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Centuria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, and help her in whatever she may require from you, for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the church of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved (laughs) Epaneatus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, My fellow Israelites who were in prison with me, they are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampelaetus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my beloved 
Stachus. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my fellow Israelite Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphania and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother to me also. Greet Asyntachristus, Phlegion, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Timothy, my co-worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my fellow Israelites. I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. Our final reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I, too, decided, as one having a grasp of everything from the start, to write a well-ordered account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have a firm grasp of the words in which you have been instructed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This week's question to ponder is about what it means for the Bible to be divinely inspired and also touches on some other issues around the Bible. This is a question that's popped up in various places and comes up often when discussing the authorship and status of the Bible within the church. There is often a failure by the people discussing what it means to admit that this term does not have a universal definition. Divine inspiration can mean different things to different people. Often, people decide that their definition is the one that counts, and anyone who doesn't believe in their definition does not believe that the Bible is divinely inspired. These views can run the entire spectrum from thinking that God dictated the Bible word for word, and that it is transmitted down to us word for word, to the concept that the authors were merely thinking about God as they wrote. As you might suspect, this has created some difficulty when people of differing opinions try to use the same phrase while meaning different things. When we look for the United Methodist view, we can turn to the Book of Discipline. United Methodists share with other Christians the conviction that Scripture is the primary source and criterion for Christian doctrine. Through Scripture, the living Christ meets us in the experience of redeeming grace. We are convinced that Jesus Christ is the living word of God in our midst whom we trust in life and death. The biblical authors, illumined by the Holy Spirit, bear witness that in Christ the world is reconciled to God. The Bible bears authentic testimony to God's self-disclosure in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as well as in God's work of creation, in the pilgrimage of Israel and in the Holy Spirit's ongoing activity in human history. As we open our minds and hearts to the word of God, through the words of human beings inspired by the Holy Spirit, faith is born and nourished, our understanding is deepened, and the possibilities for transforming the world become apparent to us. This speaks to both the way the Holy Spirit works in helping us to believe and understand as well as how the Holy Spirit moved the biblical authors to write the text that they wrote. I would like to introduce a concept here to keep in mind as we move through this idea. It is one I borrow from Peter Enns in his book Inspiration and Incarnation. He uses a parallel that I find helpful, which is that he compares how we view the Bible with how we see Christ. We accept that Christ is both fully human and fully divine. 
when we think about the Bible in the same way, as a collection of texts that are both fully divine and yet fully human, we can hold both those ideas and the tension they create. And this can help us to keep both in mind without having to pick one or the other. And I believe it gives us the fullest understanding of the Bible that we can have. We come to our first reading for today from 2 Timothy. This is usually the source for many statements about the Bible and its authority. It is reflected again in the book of Discipline on Scripture, saying that the Bible is the source for all that is necessary and sufficient for salvation, and that it is to be received through the Holy Spirit. We hear that the purpose is to teach salvation through Christ. Now, there are a few interesting things to think about when we read this, but one thing I note is a difference in translations. Some will say inspired, some will say God breathed, some will say God given, or any variation of these. Even this creates a debate. So something you might have noticed is that this topic is rife for debate at every turn. The question is, do those debates lift us up and help us to understand how people can live out God's love through the Bible in different ways? Or do we build up walls of division over our personal opinions? Now you see, one issue that we run into is that that debate itself over the translation informs us of something about scripture and interpretation. Whenever we read the Bible in English, we are reading an interpretation of scripture because someone had to decide what words in English we would read. So in some ways, when we read an English translation, we believe that the Holy Spirit will illumine us so that even in English, we understand the words of the biblical authors, be it that it was written in Hebrew or Greek. That in English, we discover the meaning and discover God. Something else that might strike you as odd is that when this was written, one could make the argument that only the Old Testament would have been thought of as scripture. Because often it was those writings from the prophets and the law that were counted as scripture. It's hard to even know if the Gospels had fully taken form as the texts that we know today when this letter was written. And so it raises an interesting question because what was scripture to the author is not necessarily the same as what we consider scripture today, including this letter. Which means that when we apply it to the entirety of the Bible as we have it now, we may be expanding greatly upon the meaning the author originally had. For me, this is an ever-present part of the Bible. And there may be many layers of meaning behind any text in the Bible. It gives us both a view of how people would have seen God in their day and helps us to understand God here in our time right now. Something that we can see is the way that the authors, in all of their humanness, can shine through in the text. We can see this in Romans. You might wonder why I picked a reading that was going to cause me to stumble over so many names, because, Lord help me, I couldn't memorize quite all of them. So why did I pick this long, personal greeting from Paul? 
Well, the reason is because it was a long personal greeting. It is a section that is very specific from a specific person to a very specific church. None of those people are here in this church right now. So it begs the question, then, why is that scripture? But in some ways, it reminds me of our joys and our prayer concerns, or our prayer list. Paul is talking about welcoming people into the church that he knows and is greeting the people that he knows of. This is a very human touch. And I wanted to stop to highlight it as we look at the inspiration of the Bible. Now, if you read a little further, you'll get another example of the very human aspect of this letter. You get the people there with Paul adding their own greetings. That includes Tertius, who is the one physically writing the letter, interjecting himself into Paul's writing so that he may greet people as well. To me, this also speaks of the Holy Spirit moving through many people involved in Paul's letter. As the Spirit would move in Paul for the inspiration of the letter, but also through Tertius to accurately record Paul's letter. And I can't help but think if those other people were present with Paul, they may have been helping him, giving their input, all moved by the Spirit, but also writing a letter to a church. And with this, we can also reflect on Paul's reason for writing the letter. He was just writing to a church in Rome that he wanted to visit, that he wanted to encourage. Paul isn't sitting down saying, and now it is time to write some scripture. Because I'm, I need to write this letter because someday it will appear in the Bible. That is not Paul's goal. Paul expects his letter to be read, yes. Just as Paul writes many letters, some of which we have lost to time. Some of which we don't know if they are written by Paul or not. But what we do have here is a letter that reveals the truth of God while also showing Paul's very human side with his own greetings and own concerns. In this, we could see that Paul could be inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak the truth of Christ and to reveal that truth in his writing, even when his writing wasn't intentionally written as the word of God. Paul does not say, God came to me and commanded, I write this letter to you. Paul writes the letter out of concern, and God inspires him to write the letter the church needed, the letter that we would all end up needing. And we can touch on this idea again with Luke. And I included this reading from Luke because I think that understanding the biblical author's intent is helpful in helping us to see the Bible as a book that is fully divine and fully human. Now, I do have to note that Luke doesn't actually name the author. The gospel, like all the gospel accounts, is anonymous. But we have the traditional attribution, and we use the name Luke to refer to the author because of that tradition. Here we have a statement from Luke about why the author is writing the gospel in the first place. To give Theophilus an account of the good news of Jesus Christ. 
Luke was looking to compile all of the accounts of the life of Jesus that he knew of so that Theophilus would have a firm grasp of everything that they'd been taught. Luke has a very human reason for writing his account, to make a well-ordered account for another person to study. The question then would be if that discounts God's role in the text. If Luke was writing for a very specific audience, not an eyewitness, but simply compiling accounts and retelling them, does that take away from Luke's inspiration? No. I don't think so, because Luke is inspired through the Holy Spirit and writes the good news of Christ, revealing the character of God, revealing salvation. Even if Luke originally intended his account to go to one audience, maybe one community, God inspired those words to go well beyond And Luke, by allowing the Holy Spirit to work through him, writes the account that we have today that informs us of God's love, that informs us of our Savior, whose life, death, and resurrection brings us salvation. Luke doesn't sit down and say, I heard this from God, or This is a message from God. Hear it. Instead, Luke writes to say that since he knows this story well, he's going to put an account together to share. As the story has been passed down from eyewitnesses, Luke is going to pass it on now and put it in writing. The question that comes in then is, Where is the divine inspiration? If Luke is just writing down what others have said, where is God in that? Well, for me, I see the Holy Spirit at work in Luke here. That Luke's account is inspired. That it is special because Luke writes the account that people needed to hear. He puts it together in a way that reveals the truth of Christ. I can see the hand of God but I can also see Luke's hand. Because though this message reveals the character of God and reveals God's love through Jesus Christ, reveals to us the Holy Spirit acting in our lives. We also see Luke's writing style. His human style and his human choices and decisions are still there. But that doesn't detract from the divine inspiration. No. If anything, it helps us to understand why each of the four gospel accounts is different. Because if we can hold that tension and live within it, of the Bible being fully human and fully divine. It allows us to see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all inspired writings, but each has a different human author, giving us a different focus, a different style, and a different telling. But because of that, I don't see God directly dictating to them. They weren't stripped of free will, only able to write something that God told them, using them as human typewriters. They wrote in their own voice for their own reasons, to their own communities. 
often with a specific audience in mind. But I don't see that human side of things detracting from the divine. Just because I can see a human hand at work doesn't mean that I can't also see God's hand. Because I can see both. What I see is that they were doing their best to understand God's character through the Holy Spirit and to transmit that into the text that they wrote. The reason that I like the idea of thinking of the Bible as fully human and fully divine is because it allows us to acknowledge both at work, that we don't have to discount one to lift up the other. We don't have to create some false sense of high and low views when we understand that God is there and nothing can detract from God's presence in the text. But we can also accept a human author writing with their own understanding in their own circumstances, limited to their own knowledge. And we see that. Whether it was the gospel authors or whether it was scribes later copying, we sometimes have geographical errors. We sometimes have disagreements about exactly what word was supposed to be used when talking about certain peoples, and it's not 100% clear. And that's okay. Because we can see the divine shining through past those things. Because we can see the divine purpose in the text. But it also means that we don't have to erase those conflicts that we don't have to bend over backwards to explain why God didn't know where this location was because we can see that in the human author doing their best to transmit what was inspired through the Holy Spirit. Because we never completely remove the human author just as we can never completely remove the inspiration of God. Now, this raises another question for us. And this is another one open for debate. And honestly, I may have raised about a dozen other questions here. But I only have so much time. For this, I present my opinion not as the only answer, but simply the answer I can provide. If the authors were inspired by God, is God still speaking today? And if so, then should we be adding to the Bible? I've heard this on numerous occasions. For the first part of that, I firmly believe God never fell silent. I don't think the Holy Spirit has ever stopped inspiring authors to write the truth of God revealed in Christ. I think that we still see God's people being moved by the Holy Spirit. I believe God is still speaking and that we see God's love reflected through human words inspired by the Holy Spirit. One example that I will always give is that I firmly believe that Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail is divinely inspired. I read in it the truth of Christ in action for today. And in some ways, that letter is just as moving today as it was when it was written. But that comes into that other question on if we should be expanding the Bible to include that letter. And to that I would say no. Why? 
The reason is that I do believe that part of the specialness, the uniqueness of the inspiration of the Bible is that in it, we have everything necessary for salvation. Does King's letter enhance my understanding of the Bible? Almost certainly. Does it add anything to what is necessary for salvation? No. And that's an important distinction that I do make. Do I see the Bible as authoritative? Yes. Can other writings enhance my understanding of the Bible? Most certainly they can. And there are so many out there that do. Can I read the works of John Wesley and see divine inspiration? I do. I can read other authors and feel the work of the Holy Spirit. But again, the Bible is special and unique because it does have everything we need. In its uniqueness, it is a special revelation. And it is divine inspiration. And it's complete. But I don't think that means God doesn't still speak to his people and through his people because we are still called to prophesy. Each and every one of us. Now I know that I have not answered every question that you may have had. And that this opens the door to dozens of other questions. And you may be confused about something I've said, and I may not have said enough. So if there is something that you need me to clarify, that you want to hear more on, if this inspired other questions in your heart, please get those questions to me. I am working on the other questions that I have received And I will be looking at those in the coming weeks. But for today, I want to leave you with the idea of the Bible as the authoritative text that it is. A fully human and fully divine work revealing God through human authors guided by the Holy Spirit. And that I truly believe that God is still speaking today. But because of that, I can rest assured that we can follow the love that we find in Scripture and know that the Holy Spirit will still inspire us today and that we will walk with the Holy Spirit growing closer in the love of the Father as we live our lives in our risen Savior. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are with us even when we turn away from you. Guide us back into your loving arms. Judge us not by the perfection of our actions, but show us mercy and love. We have strayed like lost sheep from your ways, failing both in what we have done and what we have failed to do. Bring us back into your fold that you may guide us and lead us in all things. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us. May we walk in your love and trust your ways. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. May the Lord forgive all your sins and lift you up in love through Jesus Christ our Lord and by the Holy Spirit keep you in life eternal. Amen. If you are so moved, you may make an offering and send it to the church or send it to the P.O. Box. We thank you for your continued support in these times. And now as God's children reconciled and forgiven, Let us pray the way that Christ taught us to pray, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now may we go forth. 
as we go forth reflecting the love of the Father through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, living in the love of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Let us go forth sharing in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, until we meet again. Amen.